Hi everyone. Okay, let's continue listening to Dr. Liar's lies. The uniqueness of the earth is another issue where my secular colleagues have not quite caught up to what the Bible teaches. And they never will if they use the scientific method because what the Bible says about the earth is wrong. Remember this? This is what the authors of the Bible thought the earth looked like. What the entire universe looked like, in fact. Of course they thought the earth was unique. They didn't believe in any other flat disks covered by firmaments. Science confirms that the earth is unique among the worlds of the cosmos. No, it doesn't. It's unique in many ways, but only among the worlds we currently know of. And we barely know anything about any planets outside of our solar system. Sure, we know of the thousands of exoplanets, but what we know about them is limited to rough approximations of their masses, compositions, and orbital characteristics. Sure, we know of planets that are quite Earth-like in those respects, but at this time, we can't determine whether there's life on them. Because that's obviously where you're going with us. It's uh, designed differently than these other worlds. The Bible indicates that God formed the Earth to be inhabited. Told you. But designed differently than what other worlds? The Bible doesn't acknowledge the existence of any other worlds. According to the Bible, all those little dots in the sky are really tiny and located inside the firmament, no more than a few thousand kilometers away. They're not supposed to be stars and planets as we know them today, but tiny little lights that can fall out of the sky and be trampled. Even if there is indeed no life anywhere else in the entire universe, and there's no reason to think this is the case, the Bible got it right by accident. You don't get to take credit for the occasional detail that just happened to be correct when everything else is demonstrably false. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, you know? In fact, if you think about it, Earth is three days older than any other planet in the universe, right? Because Earth's made on day one, all the celestial objects the, the sun, the moon, the stars also, were made on day four. See this little black thing here in this image of the Orion Nebula? That's a protoplanetary disk, a planetary system currently being formed by the same natural processes that formed our own. This is going on right now. Well, technically we're seeing it as it was 1400 years ago, but that's nitpicking in this context. The Earth is not three days older than these planets, but more like 4.5 billion years. Even if we accept the ridiculous 6,000 year time frame that you claim to believe in, the fact that planets are currently being formed disproves your claim that all planets in the universe were conjured into existence, presumably fully formed, by a wizard during the same week. But as an astrophysicist, you know that. You, sir? Are lying. The other worlds of the solar system, they're amazing, they're beautiful, they certainly declare God's glory, but they're not designed for life. They don't have that unique life housing property that the, that the Earth has. Okay, so let's grant that there's no life anywhere else in the solar system, which I agree appears to be the case. Let's also grant that by life we mean our form of life. Now, you, you know what, let's be even more specific. Let's say human life, as it is right now here on Earth. Isn't it interesting that the only place where we can find such life is where the laws of nature allow it to exist? Now, if humans lived inside Jupiter, walking around on ground made of metallic hydrogen and without the help of any technology, mind you, then even I could not deny that life requires a miracle. Even though it technically doesn't prove there's a god, I, I couldn't imagine being an atheist under such conditions. My body should be crushed and vaporized in a fraction of a second, yet it isn't. There's no oxygen for me to breathe in, yet my cells get all the oxygen they need in order to function. There's nothing for me to eat or drink that won't kill me anyway, yet I don't die of thirst or starvation. Clearly a miracle is at work. But instead what we find is that life exists where the conditions are those that it requires. Furthermore, we find that life here on Earth either dies out or adjusts to its environment. That's why we don't see polar bears in the Sahara Desert. And it's why the fossil record clearly shows how, for example, the ancestors of whales gradually became better and better suited to life underwater. They adapted instead of dying out. The conclusion is pretty much inescapable. It's not the Earth that was made for life. 
The Earth had conditions that allowed for life to get started, and ever since then life has adjusted itself to the planet. The hole wasn't shaped for the puddle. The puddle shaped itself to fit the hole. The fine-tuning argument is not an argument for God, but for naturalism, because it's only under naturalism that life must abide by the laws of nature. The crap-tuning argument, based on the observation that life exists where the laws of nature don't permit it, would be a great argument for theism, or at least against naturalism. Uh, now, of course, my secular colleagues expected to find life everywhere out in space, because after all, life's just a chemical accident, right? And when, when the chemistry's right, you get life. It evolves. The right chemistry is necessary, yes, but it's not sufficient. The right chemistry can be found on Venus, for example, but the physical conditions aren't right. It's too hot. Not only are there lots of physical and chemical conditions that must be met in order for life to get started, there are also conditions that must be in place in order for life to continue, and those conditions must also remain in place for a very long time in order for life to get anywhere. You'll read in some of the older scientific literature expectations of finding life on Venus and on Mars. I wouldn't say expected, but yeah, it was a reasonable hypothesis based on the evidence available at the time. This was before we discovered the surface temperature of Venus is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Exactly, because in science, you revise your understanding of a subject when new information becomes available. That's why you won't find claims from the Bible in modern astronomy textbooks, except perhaps to provide historical context. And you know this. You, sir, are lying. This raises the question, then, what about extraterrestrial life? I've already alluded to that. My secular colleagues have always expected to find life in space. It's a big universe. Life's just an accident. It evolved here, probably evolved elsewhere, where the chemistry was right. And that motivates a lot of the space program, unfortunately. Unfortunately? Though, if you had it your way, there wouldn't be a space program. There would be no science at all. If you can just look in an old book and pretend you have all the answers, what's the point doing research? And I'll grant the Bible doesn't say directly that there's no life in space, but I think there's some theological issues you're going to have to think through if there's life out in space, especially if there's intelligent life out in space, right? Do you realize the reason that we can be saved is because Jesus became one of us. He became a human being. He's a descendant of Adam. We're a descendant of Adam. That makes Jesus our relative. And so his blood can atone for us on the cross. We're all of one blood. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. It's because he's related to us that he can save us. That is a theologically important concept that follows from biblical law. But um, the Klingons and Vulcans, they're out of luck. Lieutenant Commander Worf cannot be saved because he's not related to Jesus, you see. How is that a theological problem? Worf wouldn't be descended from Adam. Even within your own theology, he would not need salvation. He's totally innocent, completely unaware of concepts such as right and wrong. He can't sin because there are no rules that he can possibly be aware of. Adam gained that knowledge and passed it on to all other humans, apparently, according to your story, that is, by eating the fruit that gave him the knowledge of right and wrong. That's why humans can sin. That's from your theology. Worf cannot have inherited original sin or even the capacity to sin. You can't break a rule if there are no rules that you can be aware of. That's the whole point of the fruit. And so you say, well, maybe the Klingons never sinned and never needed the Savior, but then they got a problem because they're living in a cursed, fallen universe because of man's sin. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, I, I see. That, it, that would be a theological problem. I, I take back what I said. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, if Yahweh were to hold Klingons accountable because this is a fallen creation. You know, if, if Yahweh were to punish Klingons as well, that would make him a psychotic, immoral, evil monster who punishes the innocent just for the hell of it. Wait, how is that a theological problem? That's exactly how the Bible describes him. And this raises an interesting question then. It's called the Fermi Paradox. 
if the universe is billions of years old, which he believed it was, and if life's just an accident on Earth, it's probably, it probably evolved elsewhere too. And statistically, it probably evolved some places before it evolved on Earth, billions of years earlier, which means there should have been other civilizations that have come and gone and should have already colonized the galaxy, but the galaxy isn't colonized. And so where are they was his question. Why is it we don't find any evidence of these past civilizations that have uh, you know, become spacefaring and colonized the galaxy? Where are they? It's a problem in the secular view. Um, no. It's not. The Fermi paradox has to do with the existence of intelligent life capable of interstellar travel. In order to apply to life in general, you have to assume that life always, or at least typically, leads to interstellar travel given enough time. There are several problems with this. First, we know of one occurrence of the phenomenon of life, and in that particular case it has led to intelligence. But is this representative? Since we only have a sample of one, there's no way to know. In fact, the same point could be raised with regards to multicellular life. Maybe the universe is teeming with single-cell organisms, but only 1% of all planets with life ever have multicellular life. We simply don't know. But I'm not surprised the creationists would rely on the straw man that evolution has human intelligence as its goal. Evolution occurs in response to circumstances. Life dies out or adapts to its environment and becomes better suited to it. It doesn't necessarily have to become more intelligent. Second, how often does intelligence lead to the development of technology? We tend to assume that intelligent organisms are similar to us. We can't do that. That's not even true here on Earth. Consider dolphins, for example. They're very intelligent, but don't have the physical means to construct anything. We have intelligence, opposable thumbs, and speech organs that allow us to communicate complex messages in an effective way. How often do these things appear together? We simply don't know. But it's not just a matter of having the ability to create technology, it's also about having a reason to do it. Humans started developing technology to get better at acquiring food. What if we were a lot stronger and had sharp teeth and claws? And what if we didn't need food? Consider that on Earth all organisms with any kind of intelligence are animals, which means that they get their energy by consuming other organisms. Why does this have to be the case? Consider a planet where plants become mobile and evolve sensory organs that let them know where they're going. That would certainly be helpful if we can move. They'd be processing sensory information so they'd have something akin to a brain. Suppose such a plant becomes intelligent enough to solve complex problems. What would an intelligent plant think about? It wouldn't have to hunt or forage. All it needs comes directly from the environment around it. Think about the ants from Lord of the Rings. Would they develop technology even if they have the physical means to do so? Again, we simply don't know. Third, does technology have to lead to spaceflight? It certainly doesn't have to. Maybe an advanced civilization becomes complacent and focuses all their effort on entertaining themselves. Maybe they find ways to upload their minds into computers or something like that. After that, why bother exploring space? Another reason to never develop spaceflight is if you happen to find yourself on a planet with high gravity or a dense atmosphere. It might simply be too difficult to get a space program started. If you've ever played Kerbal Space Program and tried to launch from EVE, you know what I mean. Fourth, we don't know how long intelligent technological civilizations tend to last. Maybe they're common, but they almost always wipe themselves out with nukes or climate change or something else that comes as a consequence of their technology before they have a chance to seriously expand beyond their home world. Fifth, let's say we have a civilization with human-like intelligence that manages to stick around for a very long time. It develops advanced technology and expands beyond its home world. Why would it ever leave its star system? What's the point? A star system is huge. Plus, if you can build a ship capable of interstellar flight, you can probably also build huge, comfortable, self-sustaining space stations. You'd have more energy than you'd ever need since there's a star to collect it from. Just build a Dyson Sphere and you can collect as much of it as you want. The only real reason to leave that I can think of would be if the star in the system is dying. But that means these trips would only occur once every few billion years at most. 
I don't see any reason why anyone would ever colonize the galaxy. It's just not practical. If you can do it, you don't need to do it. It makes for great science fiction, but in reality, we simply can't assume that spaceflight leads to interstellar spaceflight. Sixth, even if there are a few spacefaring civilizations out there, even in our own galaxy, and even if they've been around for a very long time, it doesn't follow that they're communicating in ways we can detect or that any of them have ever colonized our solar system. Even if there's a colony right next door at Alpha Centauri, if they don't use forms of communication that we can intercept, or if the colony is abandoned for whatever reason, then we simply couldn't know about it. I could probably go on, but it should be clear by now that using the Fermi paradox to prove that there is no life elsewhere in the universe at all is just plain silly. All it shows is that we don't live in the kind of universe we see in Star Trek. And that's not a problem for secular, that is, real science. And you know this. Once again, you, sir, are lying.